What causes people to be poor? It's an interesting question, and I suppose there's no question concerning the human condition for which so many answers are given with so much confidence. It is said that the people lack energy and ambition, or the country is poor in natural resources, or their economic system, capitalism, socialism, communism is wrong or the economic policies of their government are ill-conceived, or they're otherwise misgoverned, or there's no will to save and invest, or education is inadequate. There's a shortage of technical and scientific and administrative talent, or race is involved. Being poor whites or blacks or aborigines or Asians, they're too easy going or shiftless. Or their religion encourages waste or precludes effort. Or they're exploited by the rich countries. Or there's the legacy of colonial exploitation and humiliation from the past. Every day, in every part of the world, one or another of these explanations is offered very seriously. Poverty is a ghastly affliction worse in the suffering it causes than any disease, and we should know which, if any, of these explanations has merit. There's no one answer, obviously, but it's because so many explanations have a little truth that so many are offered. But one cause of poverty is pervasive, and that is the relationship, past or present, between land and the people. If we understand that, we understand the most important cause of poverty. The reason is simple and direct. Everything that allows of the first escape from privation, food, clothing, elementary shelter, comes from the land. If these needs cannot be met, there is poverty. If these things cannot be increased in relation to the numbers of people, then the poverty endures. We think of the New World, the Americas, as a favored region where the relation of land to people is, on the whole, benign. This is far from being true. There is no place where the relationship between people and land has developed with more equivocal results than south of the Rio Grande in Mexico. And not even in the Scottish Highlands or Ireland did a more ruthless correction occur than in modern times in the southern United States. But first, the case of Mexico. In Mexico, the Europeans found a highly developed culture. In the years 
before Columbus, Tenochtitlan, the city of the Aztecs, had a splendor rarely equaled in Europe. The pyramids of the sun and the moon tell of the natural forces on which life here, as everywhere, depended. The Aztec society was led by priests, and it supported a noble caste. But the base of its pyramid was formed, as always, by those who worked the land. There are still distant reminders of that agriculture. Where Mexico City now stands, as all know, was once a lake. And within the lake were floating fields, still to be seen here at Sachamico. These waterborne farms provided just enough to support a family. Aztec culture did not embrace, certainly not fully, the notion of private property and land. Although for mankind over history, it's been an easily acquired concept. Land was worked cooperatively, and what was guaranteed and protected by authority by the gods was not private property, but the right to participate, to share in the work and the food. The history of land in Mexico in the 450 years after Cortez, illustrates almost every aspect of the relationship of land to people and to poverty. Spanish colonialism we saw earlier had definite, explicit form. The rescue of souls was one purpose, and the enrichment of the crown and the colonists was the other. The colonists were granted great tracts of land, and with the grant went the right to extract revenue from the Indians and the right to extract labor, too. European feudalism was imported into the New World in a wholly precise and forthright form. The classic institution of Mexican feudalism was the hacienda. It was inward-looking, self-sufficient, governing, directing its own labor force. This hacienda stretched to the mountains around. In Mexico, acreage was always more important than quality of cultivation. After independence in 1821, the haciendas were further enlarged at the expense of the communal lands of the people. By 1910, 95% of the farm families had no land at all. 5% owned nearly half of Mexico. 17 families owned nearly a fifth of the country. The privileged have regularly invited their own destruction with their greed. The authentic voice of the landless poor was Emiliano Zapata. Other leaders were intellectuals, even landowners. He was from the soil. The explosion of which he was so much a part came in 1910. Mexicans like to say that theirs was the first of the 20th century revolutions. Certainly it was the first revolution ever to be captured on film. And it did change not a government, but a social structure. Zapata's cry of land and liberty, anticipated by seven years, Lenin's slogan of peace, bread, and land. The Mexican Revolution, though real, lasted a long time, as have these railway coaches, which ever since have stood on the tracks here at Coahuatla. There is another monument at Coahuatla to Zapata, its son as was thought appropriate to a hero as to a saint, it is in gold. Eventually, much in the 1930s by Cardenas, the land was returned to the communes, to the ajitos. The great houses on the haciendas remained the symbols of all that was hated, and they were allowed to fall into ruin, and only the shells remained. The people on the haciendas were poor, needless to say. The restoration of the ajitos did not make them rich. There remained too many people, 
too little good land and very little capital to pay for improvement. And the ghost of Thomas Malthus also walked here. When there was improvement, there were more people to consume. So an equilibrium of poverty remained, and it still persists. It is with this problem that the people and the government of Mexico now contend. That irrigation, hybrid grains, machine cultivation, fertilizer, can increase agricultural output is not in doubt. But if people are poor, all that is produced is consumed. Nothing remains to spend on seed stock or on fertilizer, which is vital and expensive. And there is a further problem. Small communal holdings lend themselves well to social idealism, but badly to machine cultivation. Where money, space, land are available, Mexican agriculture is as progressive as any. The Green Revolution was born here in Mexico's experimental stations. It was for the work in Mexico on grain hybrids that Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Prize. And it was work of the highest level of compassion, work that has already saved millions from hunger, disease, famine, and death. But the Green Revolution does not alter the lesson of Mexico. For capital and land are not available, the equilibrium of poverty continues. It can be broken in only four ways. One is to provide more land, which is a hard thing to do. The second is to invest in improved cultivation, and we've just seen the difficulties. The third is birth control, which is a further story in itself. The fourth solution is for the people to leave. To leave is a decision the individual can take for himself. It requires very little money. In Mexico, it means Mexico City and too often unemployment. So better the United States across the border to Texas or California. You get sent back a few times, but in the end, you make it. In the southern United States, the lesson of land and people continues. It's a mistake to imagine that the equilibrium of poverty belongs only to the history of the third world. But here the equilibrium has been broken. We think of man's search for food as a great force for change. Clothing has in fact been far more important. The search for silk sent traders to India and China. Machine spinning and weaving of cloth made the Industrial Revolution. And the resulting demand for wool was what turned the north of Britain over to the sheep. Textiles first made Japan a power in world markets. In 1794, Eli Whitney, a Yankee, solved the problem of getting cotton seeds out of the cotton fiber in which they were very closely entangled. A saw tore off the fiber and the cotton gin and the new textile machinery then created a vast demand for cotton. The further result was to revive slavery, especially in the South and especially here in Mississippi. Previously, slavery had been economical only for a few crops, tobacco, rice, sugar, and men with a reputation for foresight. The self-appointed futurologists of that time had been saying it, that it would soon be obsolete and it would soon disappear. Thanks to Whitney and the cotton gin, slavery now had a huge, wonderful revival.
Here below the levees, the influence of cotton, sometimes sugar, was most profound. The plantation brought the people here, organized their lives, housed them, possessed them. To make a cotton crop, a cotton crop, I must tell you, is always made, not grown, required gangs of labor for planting, chopping, picking, and labor productivity was maintained by the voice and the whip of the overseer. There have been radically different views of the slave. To the antebellum planter, he was a happy, feckless child, protected in his or her innocence by the wise owner. To the abolitionist, in many sense, the slave was a dehumanized, ruthlessly exploited piece of flesh. His enslavement saved the planter from the penalties of his own incompetence, his inability to survive in a free enterprise world. In a very recent view, the slave was a valuable piece of property, serving in a profitable enterprise. So he was fed well, treated with decency, given medical care when sick. Free workers at the time, it is argued, were no better off. This last argument rests, it appears, on some rather dubious statistics. Also, not many free workers applied to be slaves. In the northern states, the farmer owned and farmed his own land, reaped gain and suffered loss. So his was the whip on his own back. There were no mansions like this. The classical motif on the southern plantation is worth a thought, a conscious or unconscious imitation of Greece. Another society that also proclaimed its democracy and was also a leisured aristocracy based on disenfranchised slaves. As to the slaves, well, the downtrodden have always had a formula for dealing with the burdens and cruelties of this world, and it's to tell themselves of the rest and the peace that will be theirs in the world to come. be organized, the old cotton economy was an equilibrium of poverty. The Civil War came, slavery went, and cotton production was quickly restored. By 1877, cotton production was higher than before the war, but the basic relationship of people to land remained unchanged. The equilibrium of poverty was not broken by the freeing of the slaves. The former slave now got a share of the crop, sharecropping. The landlord furnished him his food with the furnish to be repaid out of the next crop. Before, the worker was enslaved by law, now by debt and also the absence of anywhere else to go. The central fact of the South was still people and land. 
even had all revenues been equally divided between planter and sharecropper, all would still have been poor. Before World War II, there were 764,000 blacks in the farm labor force of the southern states. By 1970, 30 years later, there were only 160,000, only about a fifth as many. Mississippi was the, <coughs> was the greatest of the cotton states, and in consequence, the equilibrium of poverty was here the most highly developed of any state. And in further consequence, Mississippi was the poorest state in the whole Union. Before World War II, Mississippi had 107,000 black farm workers. In 1970, there were fewer than 18,000. It was no longer economically necessary in the South to have a poor, docile, badly paid, exploited labor force. Civil rights for blacks had become economically feasible. Again, we see the influence of economics on morals and civic behavior. The effect of economics in this case, I would put slightly above that of both the Congress and the Supreme Court. The equilibrium has now been broken. Some of the old plantation families have survived to see it happen. Machinery, the cotton picker especially, replaced the people. This giant tube inhales the cotton for the plantation's own gin. Now the planters possess not people, but machines. Not only did machines replace people, but cities became an alternative. And so today the migration is over. That is because there are very few rural workers left to go. In fact, in recent years, some have returned, although not to the farms. Nothing speaks so of romance, is so celebrated in essays, verse, and sermons as the love of people for their land. These people were not attached to this land, and it was a good thing, perhaps. The South has changed, but the great river remains and the remnants of the old cotton culture are now here for the tourists. So far, we've been looking at the dark side of the moon, but there was a better relationship between land and people, and to see it, we come to a landscape that I know very well, Port Talbot, on the Canadian shore of Lake Erie. Port Talbot is the slightest center of waterborne commerce in all the world. In the last hundred years, all of the commercial cargo it has received could have been carried in a rowboat and there has been no rowboat. But this notable non-port has also its lessons on land and people. In 1803, a young Irishman, fresh from the King's service, arrived on this scene, on this shore. His name was Thomas Talbot. He is buried here, two or three miles from Port Talbot, 
It's a small and beautiful place. The colonists were from the Scottish Highlands, a race of which Colonel Talbot greatly disapproved. They make the worst settlers, he once said. English are the best. But the Scotch, as my forebears called themselves, were then available in considerable volume. You remember the Highland clearances, the people expelled to make way for the sheep. Many who were so cleared ended up here. In Mexico and the American South, we've seen, land was handed out in huge blocks. Political power then went with ownership and acreage. Democracy was impossible, aristocracy inevitable. And it could have happened here. Each settler coming to Port Talbot was given 50 acres, provided Colonel Talbot liked his appearance, was sober that day and otherwise in a good mood. For dividing the land into 200 acre lots and laying out the roads, the Colonel kept the other 150 acres. Here was the beginning of landlordism on a huge scale. But here, democracy was saved. The colonel had no troops. He couldn't hold out against the settlers who soon wanted and got the acres next door. So there was no separation between landed and landless. All demanded and received a share in government. The landless did not accumulate in an equilibrium of poverty. And among the families so favored was mine. It was to this lovely old farm under the hill that the primordial Galbraiths came from Argyle. We always called it the old homestead. The sun shone in from the south and the north wind was kept out by the hill and everything ripened a bit earlier and better than anywhere else. This is how people lived a generation or so after they arrived. We always heard how brave they were to face the wilderness. The bravery was for those who didn't come. This was the farm of my parents. There were 100 acres here, along with another 50 up the road. Our shorthorns were modestly famous, and they led me briefly to a career in animal husbandry. I took my first degree in that subject at the Ontario Agricultural College, and a number of people have always wished that I might have remained with this field of study. This farm is, I believe, unremarkable, although it certainly didn't seem to me so when I was young. It seemed to me a lovely place, marred by a certain number of rather tedious chores. There's only one advantage in being born on a working farm, a farm where you have to make a living, and that is that nothing ever afterwards really seems like work. From these farms, and others across the border in the United States, came the last of the great adventures in colonization, the settling of the Canadian West. It's surprisingly recent. When I was a youngster here in Ontario, people were still pulling up stakes, that is what they called it, and moving to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Until almost that time, the Canadian railroads still had colonist cars, bunks and benches and stoves on which to families could cook, all designed to ferry people to the West at the lowest possible cost. The Canadian westward movement completed what may well have been the most important single economic development of the last century. That was the occupation of the great, empty, grain-growing lands of the world by Europeans. The United States, Argentina, Australia, the Canadian prairies, these lands now produce a fifth of the world's bread grains and most of the exportable surplus. There is a vision of the world which has the poor, densely populated countries of the third world tilling the soil, supplying food and materials for the industrial lands of North America and Europe. It is the reverse of the reality as suppliers of food, Canada and the United States are the first of the third world countries. This food goes to India to feed people caught up there 
in the equilibrium of poverty. Of the Scotch with whom I grew up, none was rich, but few were poor. All had property, farms, houses, and my youth a Model T, beyond the dreams of those who remained in Scotland. But even from the favored Ontario countryside, some people had to go. I'll go out there and I'll never come back I'll find me a husband and a good one too If I have to go to the caribou One by one we'll all clear out Begin to batter ourselves no doubt Clear and little how far we go From the old, old folks of Ontario One by one we'll all clear out Begin to batter ourselves no doubt Clear and little how far we go From the old, old folks of Ontario Coming to Canada, the settlers came to empty lands. The democratic instinct forced democracy in land ownership, and that helped ensure it in government. The already populated lands were and remain a far harder case. Here, the relationship of people to land is long-standing, half as old as time itself. One such case is the Punjab. The great plain watered by the five rivers that give it name and life and that stretches across northern Pakistan and India. Punjabis mostly own the land they work. Holdings are modest, but they are not microscopic. The lesson here in the Punjab is of the age-old pressure of people on the soil and of the power of tradition and family and religion to make academic the most discussed of all measures for redressing the relationship between crowded land and people, that is, birth control. A modern love story tells it all. A young Punjabi woman is returning home from university to her village and to the man she is to marry. She's returning to the land of her father and to the village and the family traditions that are here the decisive force. All who know this world would share her knowledge of the power of this tradition. It's the rock on which the reforms of many a casual amateur have foundered. You remove the cast marks of that other civilization. Almost automatically, you prepare. It is proper that the bridegroom should watch her arrival discreetly from a distance. It's her father who comes to the bus stop. The greeting at home will be warm, affectionate. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Bismillah. My daughter is coming. Come, daughter. What are you doing? Thank you. 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 Thank her father has reminded her that she is a woman and at home. She had thought of her return to this world, and now it is here, real. Many have had this experience, 
returning from school, from a journey, a long absence, you know the feeling. First the anticipation, and then the fact. For her, now, the fact. I am a village woman again. Village women produce children. In the village, family planning, birth control, they're alien phrases. In this culture, marriage is not left to the young. Their judgment is warped by love, so wiser, cooler heads arrange it. Bride and groom meet, but casually, even clandestinely. Their conversation illuminates their hopes and their fears. पिछले साल बहुत अच्छी फसल हुई और सारा काम मैंने खुद संभाल लिया पढ़ लिख कर ये कुछ करना था तुम्हें तो तालीम हासिल करने की क्या जरूरत थी बिल्कुल फसडी हो तुम तो अरे पागल कहीं की तुम क्या समझते हो कि इस काम में तालीम की कोई जरूरत नहीं अरे बहुत जरूरत है इसका मतलब ये है कि तुम मुस्तकिल ही रहने का इरादा क्यों लेकिन मुझे ये सब कुछ पसंद नहीं है क्या ये कि मुझे गांव में रहना पसंद नहीं क्या कह रही हो तुम क्या कहा तुमने मुझे गांव की जिंदगी पसंद नहीं है क्या खराबी है गांव की जिंदगी में यहां सच्चाई है मुखलस लोग हैं प्यार है गांव की शहरों की तरह यहां अफरा तफरी नहीं है लेकिन मुझे क्या फायदा इस तालीम का मैं तो सुझे था शहर जाकर नौकरी करूंगी और तुम मुझे इन और तो जैसा बनाना चाहते हो हो समझने की कोशिश करो तुम क्यों बना दिया थे औरत तुम भी पढ़ी लिखी हो मैं भी पढ़ा लिखा हूँ हम दोनों मिलकर इनकी हालत बेहतर बना सकते हैं मुझे इनकी हालत से कोई दिलचस्पी नहीं लेकिन मुझे है इनकी हालत को बेहतर बनाना मेरी जिंदगी का अवलिन मकसद इसलिए कि मुल्क की तरक्की जरा से गाँव की तरक्की से इसीलिए मैं इन लोगों से प्यार करता हूँ इन खेतों से प्यार करता हूँ इसीलिए मैं इस मट्टी से प्यार करता हूँ कि मट्टी मेरे लिए सब कुछ है मेरे लिए सोना है तुम्हें यहां रहना पड़ेगा तुम मुझे बच्चे पैदा करने वाली मशीन बनाना चाहते हो So she puts the world of the city, the university, behind her. They will be married. She has shown us what happens when the modern world comes to the traditional village culture. She will be valued by her husband for the sons she produces. The assurance these sons provide that her husband will have support in his old age will not have to toil all of his years in the hot sun. And so the marriage and the children will follow. Kabula, 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 Kabula. But first, the wedding feast. Punjab, by Asian standards, is a favored land. Contraceptives, vasectomy, these can be afforded. The Indian Punjab has taken the huge step of limiting the number of children by law. But we see the force of tradition here. And elsewhere in the crowded lands, it is much, much greater.
You will ask about land reform. Land can be redistributed. And this is being done in both the Indian and the Pakistani Punjab. But if there isn't enough land to begin with, you only redistribute poverty. So all that remains as a solution is a gain for the people to go. The Punjabis are wonderfully apt students of this solution. In a rational world, these diligent, good-natured, mechanically alert, ambitious people would everywhere be wanted. None would be left at home. Is it possible for such people to find, or better still, to build an urban alternative? Can rural poverty be replaced by decent, middle-income, urban existence? There is some evidence in favor. The Asian offshore islands, Japan and Formosa, Hong Kong and Singapore, all employ the former rural poor. Singapore is the most spectacular case. This city-state lacks every resource, including space. It is 27 miles long, 14 wide, and a moderately ambulatory citizen can easily traverse it on foot in a day, along with space, minerals, raw materials, food, energy, everything except people is lacking. Because so much is lacking, Singapore does show what is possible. Its modern history begins with the Japanese surrender in 1945. There was an earlier surrender, but only this one is commemorated here in wax. Then its future was as a British colony or protectorate. And now the remnants of British culture are hard to find. I think this day is the 1945年9月12日,這個重要的日子. But if you want to feel like a rubber planter down for the week or a Somerset mom on a visit, you can still go to Raffles Hotel. What is it that makes a country that's without land, without material resources, almost without space? actually work and work pretty well for its two million people. Provide them with a per capita income that's around nine times that of India, maybe six times that of China. There must be a lesson for the world here in Singapore, and we should know what it is. Location will surely be cited. Singapore is on one of the great ocean crossroads of the world, and for generations, it has been a dividing line. People have said east of Singapore, west of Singapore. But being on a crossroads has worked no similar miracle for Panama or for Suez. I would divide the credit between the people and the government. The talents of three races, Chinese, Indians, Malays, are blended here and they work together without the fettering traditions to which they would very often be subject in their home countries. Migrants and their descendants always work better than people who have been too long at home. It's very unfashionable in our time to explain economic development by race or ethnic origin. 
We carefully avoid it in books, although we take it for granted in conversation. I would attribute much in Singapore to the excellent ethnic admixture. The Mandarins are the Chinese. They bring to Singapore their art and their ancient experience of organization. Singapore is organized, led by the Chinese. Malays provide the traditional crafts and services. Here fishing, and here in a national dance. And finally, the Indians. Some are Tamils, a few Punjabis. Indians are traders, lawyers in the professions. Most numerous, the Chinese. An interesting and indispensable man, this, he is Hao Yun Chong, minister for whatever needs to get done. He is the Development Bank, Airline Port Authority, head of the civil service the all-purpose public entrepreneur. And Lee Kuan Yew, the all-purpose politician. He is one of the more remarkable and durable people of our time. Also an old friend. Once a few years ago, he decided to take a sabbatical leave from being prime minister and came to Harvard for a term. I see you've got a rather strange configuration. Here they concentrate on land reclamation, increasing Singapore's scarcest resource and what it costs. And on the port, a uniquely vital facility. Work out to per square foot. About two dollars and twenty-nine cents a square foot. It would cost at least eight dollars in the port because the water there is deep. Including the shore protection works, I think. And and if you take into consideration They are practical men pragmatic, which is to say they test action not according to theory, but according to what works. The price of the value of the... What is it? The price of the value is... 100 200. He's getting more. I know he's getting more. How so, Yun Chong reports on the economic prospect. Like all who so report, he says things are getting better, but he adds a sour note or two. Upsetting precedence. So we can ignore this one. Ignore this one. Doesn't make very much difference. All right, next, how's your economic indicators? I think we are passing through probably the uh, trough. And balance, I think we probably have seen the uh, worst with the coming, oh, this, in, this, coming this. in of the Christmas, New Year season, I think there'll be more. The inventories have been run down completely now. And there will be... I think a slight improvement over the next few months, two or three months. So we won't end up with a plus two to three. We'll end up with a plus half to one. Plus one to two. I think your, your, your prognosis was correct, between one and two. The Singapore government contribution is to make pragmatic use of all ideas and to refuse to be the captive of any one idea. Is Adam Smith alive here? The answer is very much. There can be few places in the world where self-interest is pursued more diligently and with more visible enjoyment in the results. Does Cain survive here? also very much. Public and private outlays are related as a matter of course to the availability of workers and the current and the prospective capacity of the economy. The post-Keynesian view of inflation, a view with which I've been very much concerned, is also treated with real respect 
in Singapore. Wage settlements are carefully controlled to minimize inflation and keep Singapore products competitive in world markets. When others, other people talk of an incomes policy, Singapore economists and businessmen and union leaders must surely yawn because they've had one for many years. Is there planning? Is there socialism in Singapore? Have the Webbs and Franklin Roosevelt and Clement Attlee been here? Would Enoch Powell and Barry Goldwater be distressed? The answer again is yes. If housing, the harbor works, transportation, trained people, if any of these are needed or other things, the government provides them. Self-interest serves pretty well as a motivation, but it is recognized in Singapore that it does not serve all purposes and that it serves best within a framework of careful overall planning. Singapore has another virtue. The rhetoric of both free enterprise and socialism is almost completely absent. This is also aesthetically rather a treat. Singapore doesn't lend itself to the starry-eyed voyage of discovery. Success has a price, necessary or otherwise. Some of the rules governing personal behavior have been intrusive and petty. And in a world of soft states, Singapore is a very hard one. Lee Kuan Yew comes here to open Parliament. And Parliament is a very acquiescent body. A parliament, in fact, can be a little like a company board of directors controlled by the management. Large companies are not democracies of their stockholders, nor is Singapore. Commercialization also has its artistic price. This uh, miscarriage celebrates a notable Singapore product. The Tiger Bomb Gardens. But let us not be elitist, perfectionist. Something against which we're all warned these days. Singapore does provide its people with a decent and very agreeable existence. Singapore does show that there can be a solution to the problem of many people and too little land. Many people do live here and live very well on very little space. The concept of a city-state is valid and workable. But we had better not suppose that it is a safe or an easy solution. For one thing, it requires peace. Singapore must have friendly, well-disposed neighbors. War almost anywhere could be a disaster. And everything depends, too, on the continuing good sense of the government and the people. Change anywhere else in the world, recessions, inflation, alterations in trade routes, affect Singapore and it cannot affect such changes. It must always adjust to these changes, and this adjustment must be governed by thought and not formula, pragmatism and not ideology, and cool good sense and not political passion. That is the kind of government that is required, and the people must have the confidence and the good nature and the discipline to accept change even when it hurts. Singapore is small and Asia is vast. It isn't an escape for very many of the Asian poor. It shows only that there can be an urban industrial solution and that whatever the pain of the city, 
It is less than the hunger and the deprivation of the village. <laughs>